Good morning and welcome all, and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Matt Holdstock, and I'm an enologist at the Australian Wine Research Institute. In today's session, we'll be hearing about the spoilage yeast Britannomyces and how it is adapting to control measures such as sulphur dioxide. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the Adabari Extension Project. Before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders to anyone who's new to the Adabari webinar, webinar platform. If you'd like to provide a comment or ask a question throughout, please click on the Q&A button on the bottom of the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and click to send it through. We'll hold the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but feel free to send through your questions at any stage. A reminder also that this session is being recorded and the link will be sent through to you later via the Adorize YouTube channel. We'd also like to collect data today on your knowledge on this topic. And you should see a one question survey pop up on your screen asking you to rate how much you know about the increased adaptation of Britannomyces to SO2. So if you could please rate your knowledge on this topic on a scale of zero to 10 with zero being nothing and 10 being an expert on this topic. And at the conclusion of today's webinar, the same question will be asked at the end of the presentation. For anyone who's just joined, uh, welcome. Uh, today's webinar topic is Britannomyces and how it is adapting to control measures such as SO2. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Anthony Bornman from the Australian Wine Research Institute today to present on this topic. Anthony is a Molecular Biology Research Manager at the AWRI and an affiliate of the University of Adelaide. Anthony leads research that is focused on applying genomics to understand the genetic basis of biological diversity in winemaking, including grapevines, commercial wine yeast and bacteria and wild ferments. So Anthony, if you are ready to make a start, I will hand control over to you. Okay, thanks, Matt. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. So yeah, I'm just going to give a rundown on work that we've been doing in the space of Britannomyces um, and trying to understand its uh, ability to potentially adapt to the control measures that we're using against it. So of course, Britannomyces is often found in fermented, fermentative environments. Um, in many situations, it's actually a positive. So outside of wine, so for example, in kefir, beer, kombucha, biofuel, it's actually can be you know a, a positive attribute of the microflora. But of course, for wine, uh, not so much. And spoilies by Britannomyces can give you these negative sensory attributes, elastoplast, barnyard, metallic taste. And of course, as the breath flavor goes up, there have been studies to show um, from red wine consumers that consumer liking goes down. So of course, we're all looking to avoid Britannomyces in our winery and in our wine. But where does it come from when we're talking in a wine situation? So as far as Britannomyces go, there are links back to the vineyard. So it is thought that there are vineyard sources of Britannomyces, although it is rarely isolated from grapes. So it is very rare. And for us to see it in, a, in an investigative situation, we often need enrichment media to try and find Britannomyces within all the other yeast microflora. So it is very rare on grapes. And... As yet, because it is so rare, there is no solid evidence of vineyard isolates actually progressing through to spoiling wine. And we're looking at doing genome sequencing, perhaps to try and link this. So we think maybe it can come from the vineyard, but certainly once it's in the winery, however it gets there, it becomes a big issue. And in the winery situation, of course, the main area where you're going to run into problems with Britannomyces is with barrels. So once it gets into barrels, it can penetrate really deep into the barrel staves, you know, upwards of a centimetre within the into the wood as the barrels sort of breathe through temperature changes. So it can be really hard to get rid of Britannomyces from infected barrels, and then it can be passed around the uh, the winery if you are if you are unfortunate enough to get Britannomyces into your winery. So it's quite hard to get rid of. 
if it's coming in from the vineyard and it can hide in all sorts of places. So if we can't get rid of it, can we at least control it? And work done by Chris Curtin and others sort of back in the early 2000s now to look at what are the best ways to control Brett showed that general winery cleanliness and barrel sanitation could go a long way to controlling Brettanomyces in the winery. And also the addition of sulfur dioxide, SO2. Now, SO2 addition is complicated as far as controlling Brettanomyces. While we can work with total SO2, you know, for example, we had 80 mix total SO2 in a wine, there's only a, a portion of that that's actually free SO2, which comprises the active component of SO2. And then within the free SO2, we have the molecular SO2 shown here in green, which is a very, very small component. And it's the molecular SO2 that is actually the antimicrobial. So while the total SO2 can be a sort of antioxidant, it's the molecular SO2 that is actually there to be an antimicrobial and actually control the breath. And this is where pH comes in. So you can see here in this graph, as pH rises, the actual molecular component of a set amount of total SO2 drops. So if we're talking about using 0.6 molecular SO2 as a rough rule of thumb to control Brettanomyces in red wine, for example, if you've got 20 mgs of free SO2 at pH 3.4, you're above that 0.6 threshold but you very quickly as the pH rises drop below that at 40 mg free, you'd be well above mole the molecular SO2 level that you need at pH 3.4, for example. But once you start getting up above pH 3.8, you actually don't have enough molecular SO2 to necessarily control breath. So SO2 in context of the wine pH is really important for trying to set a level of molecular SO2 to control breath. The problem arises is that there's genetic variation in Brettanomyces now. And when you've got a single control measure, that being SO2, biological systems often find a way to adapt to that control. And this became apparent um, in study again by, by Chris Curtin early in the 2000s, where a industry-wide survey was done of Brettanomyces, looking at the genetics of, of what sort of Brettanomyces strains are out there. And for the most part, we could divide Brettanomyces into a number of different genotypes. With the predominant genotype, you can see there almost 85% being this green, um, green group. When the different genotypes are put onto sort of a family tree for Brett, here's our, our, our green group there, classify or classically associated with the strain that we have internally called AWRI 1499. Now, what was interesting is these genetic groups have different uh, characteristics as far as tolerance to SO2. And again, we can see that our green group, which is the most predominant, this AWRI 1499 group, actually had a far higher maximum molecular SO2 concentration at which they could still grow compared to some of these other genotypes. So the predominant genotype in industry was also the most SO2 resistant. So it seems like the use of SO2 as a control measure for Brett is actually imposing an adaptation, a selective pressure to then push that genotype to become more common. Now, what's interesting, if we look at these genotypes in more detail, and again, this is a, a family tree on the, the left-hand side, just color-coded by different um, family groups or clades, we actually see that there are some pretty major genetic changes that are that are coming through the Brettanomyces family tree. So it's not simple sort of little tweaks. There are some major changes where some of these strains are actually triploids. So if we have a little chromosome, you know, most strains should be diploid. There should be two copies of each chromosome or a 2N over here on the side. 2N is the normal situation that we see across you know, most yeasts, even humans and, and plants and things. The 1499 group of strains actually have three copies of all of their chromosomes. They're called triploids. And there are other triploid hybrids that are in the Brettanomyces family group. So these are thought to arise very rarely 
Um, there are hybrid Saccharomyces strains, for example, that you may use in your winemaking. Um, they are very rare situations and they were selected to become commercial strains. Um, these have been uh, natural, apparently natural hybrids that have occurred and probably because of the very high or hard selection that's imposed by SO2, it happens that some of these triploid genotypes are very SO2 resistant. So a rare event that's now been selected for and with a triploid strain being the most prevalent strain that we see across the Australian industry. So that gave us some evidence that Britannomyces is evolving or adapting to the use of SO2. But we wanted to have a look to see if we were able to drive that same sort of evolution or adaptation in the laboratory and how far we could actually push Britannomyces to sort of get an idea of, of where we might be heading. And so what we did in lab, we using lab-based media, we took three of our main uh, genotype groups for Britannomyces. And over a long period of time, we subcultured these into slowly increasing concentrations of, of SO2. Uh, much like antibiotic resistance, this is the best way to drive adaptation if you're looking to see if something can adapt. So you slowly ramp up your selective pressure, you know, the agent that you're using. And what we were able to see is that actually SO2 tolerance could evolve in the lab and could evolve quite rapidly. Um, so if we're looking across a time period of, you know, almost a year, taking measurements of the molecular or the maximum molecular SO2 that these cultures could grow at, we could see that all of them, for the three genotypes, all started to track upwards. Um, 20 out of 4, the green one, which is a haploid, there's only a 1N, didn't evolve as fast as either the diploid, which is a red, the 1613 was a diploid, or our usually much higher SO2 resistant triploid 1499. So even the triploid that had high SO2 resistance to start with, as you can see, it become very high and went from you know just below 0.4 molecular to, to up around one. So it over doubled its SO2 tolerance within a year of this uh, laboratory protocol. So yes, it seems that Britannomyces in the lab, as well as sort of what we were observing from the genotypes can evolve or can adapt to the use of SO2 and can actually, at least in this laboratory situation, adapt to very high levels of molecular SO2. So just having a look at some individual isolates, going back here to, you know, looking at the tolerance, we can see again out of these populations where we've used SO2 or passagem with no SO2, we do see these are individual isolates now rather than a population. Each of these dots is an individual strain. But again, over time in all of the populations, we are seeing increased uh, resistance to molecular SO2 relative to either the parent or populations not exposed to SO2. So it holds even at not the population level, looking at individual isolates within a population. Again, extracting out some of our, just to show you what individual isolates and, and, you know, sort of how well they can adapt to SO2. Again, here's our parent 1499 on the left, grown in a number of different concentrations of molecular SO2. Then you can see it tops out at about 0 0.6, 0 0.6. You start seeing it growing, but slowly, and then nothing beyond that. Whereas this single evolved strain of 1499, you can see here, was growing at, at one. So a molecular SO2 concentration of one mg per litre. So quite a significant increase in SO2 tolerance. So clearly we can develop SO2 tolerance in the lab. Going back to the early studies, it appears it's happening in industry, but is that, you know, is it still happening? Is it happening differently? Are changes still occurring outside of what we saw in the early 2000s? And so for this, we went through SO2 screening of additional industry isolates. So we've got isolates from three different time periods, 2000, 2004. They were isolates that were obtained back in the early study by Chris Curtin and, and kept in our culture collection. And then some later groups of isolates um, between 2010 and 2014 and 2016 to 2018. So these were all screened for SO2 tolerance. And also we screened them for chimeric acid consumption to see if there was any 
relationship between SO2 tolerance and perhaps a loss or a gain of the ability to, to make spoilage compounds, which are formed from chimeric acid. So we think, and I'll show you some data to say, SO2 tolerance is still increasing and is, is increasing over time. So again, here are our controls, 1499, the triploid, 1613. And this is another one, 2809, which is a strain that's from this 1499 group, but was shown through extra studies to be a, a little bit more tolerant. Now, each one of these dots here is an individual isolate. So these are our 2000 to 2004 isolates, 2010 to 2014, 2016 to 2019. So there's a spread of um, SO2 tolerance limits. Hopefully you can appreciate for the 2000, 2004s, they tend to top out below some of the higher ones we saw for the repeats of 2809. Some of the 2014s are sort of up there, but these 2016, 2019s, we can see there are strains up the top here. And these are strains from industry that are well above what we observed for the previous champion of, of SO2 tolerance. And in our system here, are, are, yeah, well above the one mg per litre molecular SO2 levels which again top out at above even what our lab selected uh, isolates were, were growing in. So there are some very resistant isolates um, out there in industry. As far as chimeric acid goes, we were hoping that maybe some of these tolerant strains had lost the ability to make spoilage compounds. That doesn't appear to be the case. Um, all of the isolates, except for some that we actually were able to show later on that didn't grow very well in our in our screen, but all of our isolates are consuming chimeric acid, just like our controls and doing the 4EP analysis on these, they make 4EP at levels that are consistent sort of across the board. So there's no real variation in, in the ability to make the spoilage compounds, although there is a lot of variation in, in SO2 tolerance. Looking at these highly tolerant isolates, we were able to do some genome sequencing on them to see where they came out. So these newer tolerant isolates to see where they come out as far as the, the Britannomyces family tree. So again, this is our early family tree from Chris Curtin's work. It's a newer one based on genome sequencing, but color coded in, in much the same way. Here's our 1499 clade. There's 2809 that passed um, record holder. What we found was all of the really tolerant industry isolates, all the really highly tolerant ones, the ones with more um, SO2 tolerance than 2809, which are these white dots, were all in that same clade. So they are all this triploid tolerant genotype background, but they've got small variations within that um, within that background. So there are genetic adaptations that are going on, but it's within the confines of that triploid genotype. So it seems like that highly tolerant genotype is still evolving and still adapting to the use of SO2, much like what we saw in the laboratory situation where that triploid was able to still adapt to SO2. So we're able to show it in the lab. We had a hunch it's happening in industry. It does look like it's happening in industry and that these things are adapting and becoming tolerant. So these are just Australian isolates. Are we just unlucky? Are we the unlucky country when it comes to Britannomyces SO2 tolerance? Probably not. This is a study coming out of, of Europe from 2019 um, from a French group showing that. And they, again, they looked at isolates, but they were able to go back to isolates even back to the, the 1900s. And they were actually able to show that now, we didn't see that triploid group until probably about after the 1980s in their work, but then it's becoming more and more prevalent as it is here. And this happens to be the same triploid group that we're seeing in Australia as well. So for whatever reason, whatever how it's worked, these sort of rare hybridization events have occurred and then have somehow made their way around the globe. Um, presumably because it wasn't much of a concern to try and stop yeast coming around. You know, often there's wines and juices that get around. We're not sure how, but these have been sort of 
moved around the world and sort of homogenized across winemaking areas where these Britannomyces strains are now found in Australia and in Europe, for example. And they're on, they seem to be on the rise. So it's great to say that they're here. Can we actually get rid of them? And what can we do to get rid of them? If you do actually happen to have a tolerant ice, sort of apart from throwing a lot of SO2 at it or having really low pH wines, we looked at some of these. These are all really tolerant isolates with you know a tolerance of around one mg per litre of SO2 with the exception of 1499, which is that control strain I spoke about. So we had these in media, in control media, they'll grow quite happily. Uh, we then hit the media when they're at the 10 to the 2 level with Valcorin, DMDC. So a standard concentration, 200 mg per litre of Valcorin. And that was able to knock off all of the isolates um, equally. So the SO2 tolerant isolates didn't seem to have cross tolerance to uh, DMDC. So that is one way if you need to address a tolerant Britannomyces, they are still sensitive or as sensitive as other strains to DMDC. We've also looked at Kytosan. Again, for the most part, Kytosan killed off everything where we used the Kytosan. I think it's 80 mix of Kytosan. With the exception of one isolate, this 4513, we do have to chase this up. We haven't been able to go back and, and have a look at this particular isolate again. But in this experiment replicated, it did seem to show uh, resistance to the use of kytosan. So we'd have to confirm whether or not this is the case. We hope this isn't the case. We don't want to see um, you know, tolerant isolates to multiple control measures because this strain is already tolerant to SO2. The kytosan holds, it's also tolerant to kytosan or the use of this particular kytosan, unfortunately. So there are other control or other ways to get rid of the Britannomyces outside of SO2. And of course, if nothing else, we can always try early detection um, and the use of diagnostics to try and catch the Brett at least before it spoils the wine and, and deal with with isolates early. So you've got all the, the different microbiology or direct detection methodologies. You can also look at sort of the production of 4EP. Um, I've got sensory listed here, but of course with sensory, it's usually too late then um, your wine's already spoiled, but there are ways of, of getting a 4EP early, such as GCMS. And then you've got the other um, DNA early diagnostic uh, methodologies, whether that's you know, PCR or qPCR or, or LAMP or those other ones. So as far as take-home messages, um, unfortunately, it does seem that SO2 tolerance is easily developed by Britannomyces. Tolerant isolates are present in industry, both in Australia and around the world. They don't produce more or less EP than, than other strains of tolerant isolates. Um, so if they are in there, they, they will spoil wine just the same way as a standard sensitive isolate will. Other control agents can be effective against the tolerant isolates, such as DMDC, Kytosan. Um, we hope that Kytosan result that we've got in this particular data set is um, a false positive and that we're not also getting tolerance against Kytosan, but that remains to be looked at. And then, of course, we've got all the, the sort of early, um, early detection methodologies and or detection methodologies that we can use to try and at least detect things early and stop wine being spoiled or at least address wine um, quickly. Because if we keep numbers down as well, that can also limit um, future adaptation. And lastly, and this is really important when managing your SO2 additions, take into consideration the wine pH. Um, if you're dealing in high pH wine, you do really need a lot of SO2 to get those molecular levels that are going to control Britannomyces strains. And certainly if you've got a tolerant isolate or tolerant isolates make their way in, sometimes even with high with the high pH wines, it will get really hard to get enough molecular SO2 in there to actually knock them down substantially. So I'm hoping everyone out there never has that problem, um, but certainly high pH wines, if you do happen to get a tolerant strain in there will be 
at least in theory, something that is really hard to control through SO2 additions. Um, and so for that, there are resources out there, um, both from fact sheets and calculators to calculate the amount of uh, molecular SO2 that you get based on um, wine parameters. And of course, if um, you're ever having any other trouble, please get in touch with the AWRI help desk and we'll be happy to help you out however we can, um, including, you know, trying to get samples of the Brett and working out what genotype or whatever we're dealing with for, for strains that are giving people a lot of trouble. Finish up there with acknowledgements. Of course, all our work's funded, all the Brett work through One Australia um, and the people that have done work who are still at the AWRI, but others also that have moved on. So Christian Varela, who did a lot of the work, who's now over at the University of Adelaide, Chris Curtin, with the early Brett work now at uh, Oregon State, Caroline Bartel, um, Kate Quivers, and everyone else at the AWRI. So I've finished there. That's the end of my slides. I'm happy to answer questions uh, where I can. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, just like to remind people online if they have a question or a comment, I'd like to push it through. That's um, just hit the Q&A button down the bottom of the toolbar there and uh, send it through. Okay, so there's been one question, Anthony, just come through so far. Um, any theory as to why these triploid versions arose during the not or during the 80s? I mean, the theory would be that as proper use of SO2, if you want to say proper use, as more education around judici judicious use of SO2 became more mainstream, like really using SO2 in the right way, it's just a case of adaptation. So, you know, as strains had to adapt to SO2, biology finds a way. And then you just get these jackpot events occurring. So these rare triploids that happened to find itself in a situation where being SO2 tolerant because people were really starting to know about the use of, you know, proper pH, low pH, decent amounts of SO2, it had an advantage, a growth advantage. And so then it becomes more and more prevalent. It's very much akin to antibiotic resistance that we hear about in human health. You know, these antibiotic resistant strains come up because we started to use antibiotics. And the more antibiotics we use, the more pressure there is for these strains to become resistant. Okay. Um, there's been a couple of others come through now. Um, this, uh, just any downsides to the use of DMDC? Uh, personally, from what I understand, there are regulatory issues in some areas and of course the equipment stuff that you need for dmdc it's probably something too to ask the help desk guys more i mean we can use it in lab um, and we know people use it but there are restrictions around it and it is you know not necessarily difficult to use but there are health and safety as far as i understand problems with it too it can be a hard thing to use Okay. There's been a couple of other questions come through. Um, I'll read this one out. I, I know there is a PhD student at the University of Adelaide looking at alternative strategies to inhibit Brett other than sulfur dioxide. Yep. I heard magnesium was involved. Can you provide more details? Uh, not at this time beyond that, I don't think. Um, there are, there will be, I'm sure there'll be presentations from that student. Um, it's, it's early days in their project, but what you read out is their project in a nutshell. I think it's around using new or it's around using yeah nutrient limitation potentially to control it, but it is very early days that work. Has have you have you done any work in cider on this topic? Generally cider cultivars have a higher pH, therefore Brett can be common. No, we haven't looked at cider. I know there are people that have, think have got strains out of cider in Europe, but no, we haven't looked at it here. Okay. And there's another one about sparging with nitrogen to reduce oxygen. Will this help eliminate Brett? 
Uh, Brett is quite comfortable growing in anaerobic conditions as well. Oxygen will give it a bit of a boost when barrels breathe and things like that. Um, keeping oxygen out will slow it down if you can keep oxygen out. But of course, in, in barrels and situations like that, oxygen will get in and Brett will grow under anaerobic conditions just a lot more slowly. Okay, a couple of other questions have come through. With red wines, um, is a post malolactic fermentation with high SO2 addition, say a 0.8 mole, a good protocol? I.e., is going hard early the best way to reduce potential populations? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm pretty sure the AWRI fact sheet will recommend. And that would be my recommendation as well. If you hit it with little amounts often, what happens is you get a certain amount of molecular SO2 and then as the free, as the oxygen and stuff gets rid of the, you know, the SO2 degrades, you lose that. So you top it up a bit more, you get a little bit of molecular, it goes away and it never hits a level that's going to control a tolerant bread. And in fact, that's probably a really good way to select or to help bread adapt to SO2 is to hit it with little bits often. So you're much better off hitting it with a big whack getting a really high level of molecular killing off the brett. So then it can't adapt. Dead brett can't adapt. So you're actually better off hitting it with a lump sum than lots of little bits along the way. There's another one relating to molecular sulfur. Uh, any comment on bisulfite complexes, meaning free SO2 in reds is overestimated by the aspiration method? Um, is the molecular sulfur tolerance measured in red wines or just in a wine-like medium? Uh, I don't know. I, I can't answer that one. They've got me. Okay. Sorry. Right, we can, Let me take it on notice. notice. Sure. We can probably provide an answer in the, um, in the, the email that gets sent out with the recording of this. I mean, the work, that was done, the work that was done here in lab was in wine-like media. It wasn't, for the most part, in wine, but molecular SO2 is a it is an estimate that you make for the wine as well. What concentration of sugar after fermentation is required to support the growth of Britannomyces? <sighs> Not a lot, I guess, is the answer. Um, Britannomyces is an excellent scavenger. If you don't have enough free sugar, sugar, it can grow on all sorts of things, including um, chitosan, including really rare sugars that Saccharomyces can't use. It is a scavenger. I mean, reducing your sugar levels at the end of primary is a great way to slow it down. Um, the less sugar, the better. But Britannomyces is the king of scavengers as far as if you have it in there, it will find a way to grow um, on lots of other stuff. So there is no necessarily safe level of sugar that would then dictate that you won't get Britannomyces spoilage. Okay, and the last question at the moment is, could electric pulse technology used after all fermentation be useful to kill any residual brett so I'm guessing high voltage across electrodes as wine passes through. I have heard of that um, and a few other techniques like high pressure. We haven't looked into those techniques ourselves. Um, from what I understand, the, the papers that are out there would suggest that that may be an option, but I haven't had any actual experience with, with how well it works in our hands or know of anyone personally that's actually used it. It's one one comes through about temperature. So can high temperature kill Brett? For example, if we were to clean barrels with some high temperature vapour, so I'm guessing that's steam cleaning. Yeah, I mean, that. I mean that's the best way to clean barrels is, you know, real steam them, hot water. But again, um, you know, there's always a balance between how much do you have to do to get rid of Brett versus wrecking your barrels. And the brett can get pretty deep into some of those staves uh, where it can be difficult to sanitize the barrels. It's still best practice 
but I guess in a lot of situations with Brett, and and that is a situation that's really hard to study, um, is what do you have to do actually to kill Brett from within an infected barrel? And it's a, a sort of situation we haven't worked out a good way to get a definitive answer on, but it is still best practice. So the hotter and and more you can steam your barrels, probably the better. But again, there's no hard and fast rule that, yeah, you'll make a barrel sort of sterile again if it had bready wine in it. Okay, and I think this will be the last question. Um, does pH control during and after ferment restrict Brett aside from the effect that pH has on the sulfite equilibrium? Mm -hmm. There is some evidence that lower, P, lower pH will certainly... Sorry, lower pH will make it more difficult for Brett to grow, but you do have to get down to really low pHs for that to happen. Um, higher pHs will make life easier, though, even in the absence of the SO2. It's just a more friendly environment. So when the pH is lower, the Brett's got to work harder to keep its metabolism going, so it sort of slows it down a bit doesn't slow it down as much as you would probably like until you get down into pHs around, you know, three or sub three. Actually, there has been one more come through. Um, did your, actually, there's a couple more come through, sorry. Um, did your work uh, focus on or use natamycin to stop Brett growth? No. No. So we haven't looked at natamycin. Um, does Brett grow well in higher alcohol percentage wines? Uh, alcohol is also something that will slow it down. So higher alcohol, again, will make it harder. And that, that always goes, you know, if you've got a low pH, high alcohol wine, in the absence of SO2, that is still a more unfavourable environment for the Brettanomyces. But again, the Brett can handle relatively high pHs. Oh, sorry, relatively high alcohol levels. So it will slow it down, but not to a point where it becomes necessarily relevant. If you've got bread in there with no SO2, a high pH, a high alcohol wine will still spoil, just maybe a little bit slower. And there's one more. Um, would you recommend more the use of high temperature vapor or ozone in a barrel cellar to control growing of Brett at the moment you discover it? Uh, I'm not sure I'm in a rec in a position to recommend either because I'm not 100% down on which one would be better. So that's another one I'll have to take on, on notice. I don't know. And I should stop saying last question because they keep coming through. <laughs> keep going through. Is there any way to test barrel surface for Brett contamination? Barrel surface as in the inside. Ooh, geez. Um, if you could, technically, I mean, if you can get a swab in there to swab the bottom and things like that, you could swab it and then put it through a DNA test, for example, or some sort of enrichment test. So yes, you could look at those surfaces. Um, whether the surface Brett is a problem as opposed to the Brett that's been sort of drawn into the wood and into the staves, that's another matter. But you, in theory, yes, you could you could swab the surface of a barrel through the bung hole when it, when it was empty um, and test that, whether or not it's going to give you an idea of whether there's Brett further in the barrel Certainly, if it was pretty wine in there and you've taken the wine out and you swab the barrel, you'll see the bread. Um, if you wanted to test after you'd steam cleaned it or hot water washed it excessively, you may not have bread on that surface, but the bread may still be deep in the staves of the barrel. There's another one regarding chitosan usage. So any insight on chitosan usage on high pH red wines instead of going so high with the molecular SO2? Um, yeah, chitosan and chitosan products will help to kill Brett. 
or kill bread. You know, some are cytotoxic that, you know, some will find the help to find the bread out. Some will actually be cytotoxic depending on the exact chitosan. Um, I don't have experience with long-term storage with the chitosan. So using it as an alternative during storage, but certainly as a, you know, knock it down effect, it, it works. Um, but we haven't looked at an interplay between chitosan and SO2 necessarily for, for storage, for example. That's something we haven't looked at yet. How does breath survive in a soused barrel or come back to life when it's refilled? Um, it's way down deep in the wood. It lives off not much. It you know, can tick over for long periods of time. Um, you know, from a, at, at one stage we grabbed, you know, I've done work on an old shipwreck beer that was a couple of hundred years old and there was live Britannomyces in that. And they've been sitting on the bottom of the ocean for a couple hundred years. So um, yeast can go into, you know, like a hibernation. They'll sit there very slowly, metabolically active for a long period of time. And then the barrel starts breathing once you've refilled it and you get some nutrients getting in there and they kick off again. You might have answered this question already in some of your answers, but will Brett grow at low temperature? Slowly. So like a lot of yeast, to a point, if you lower temperature, you will lower their metabolic activity and they'll they will grow. They'll just grow more slowly. Right. That was um quite a long question and answer session. There's quite a few come through there. So thank you, I'm Anthony. Sorry, I can't um, I couldn't answer all of them, but yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff we don't know and a lot of stuff still I don't know. Right. Uh, okay. I'd just like to, um, seeing there's no more questions, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, just like to thank Anthony for joining us today and providing insights into Britannomyces and its um, increasing resistance to SO2, which is, I'm guessing, quite scary. Um, I'm sure everyone who attended today got a lot out of the session. I'd also like to thank the audience for logging in and taking part. And just to remind you that, as always, you will, you will receive a link to this webinar uh, and the recording of this presentation, which will be available on the Adverise YouTube channel within 24 hours. We will be back again next week uh, with another Ada Bry webinar, and that will be on Thursday, the 28th of September. And that will be looking at exploiting flavour precursors for improving white wine flavour. And if you'd like to register for this session, please visit the Ada Bry website. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next Ada Bry webinar. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.